Good morning. Happy Monday. Good to see you today. Well, I can't really see you, but anyway, glad you're here. It's good to be aware of you. You can see me, you know, not much of a trade there, but anyway, glad that you can be here with me and study the Word of God together. We're starting a new thing today. We're starting in 1 John, and I want to do something a little different with 1 John. I want us to walk through it together, and here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you every day, if, if you're one of those that's watching every day, I've got a handful that watch every day, and that's great. Get your Bible. Um, if you want to write something down, that's fine. But I'm, we're going to just start where we left off the previous day, and we're just going to go verse by verse, talking about what it says. And, and I'm going to share my thoughts and understandings and that kind of stuff. But if you have thoughts, insights that you, you get out of this, I'd like you to put them in the comments. Uh, I think everybody would benefit from hearing what you've got to say too. And so let's, let's, it'd be like if we we're all in the room together, got my coffee. You don't have to drink coffee, but if you do, you know, we can just get around the table together and just read the word together and share it. Um, you know, I'm going to do most of the talking because you don't want to sit there and look at me just going most of the time. So, but anyway, anytime as we're looking at this, share a thought, an insight, a question, an idea, uh, something you've learned from it. Maybe you've heard somebody else preach on this and you've heard something that, that you really liked. And, and uh, you know, that's what I want to start doing for at least for at least for now. We'll see how it goes. And uh, I want to invite us to where we're more interactive, that we're being the body of Christ together, studying the word together. And uh, and I want to hear what you got to say. So let's let's bow together and let's begin. Father, we thank you for your love and goodness. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, as we gather around your word, uh, your word takes center stage. You are the one who's here to teach us. We're all here to learn from you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, uh, you'd speak to us and guide us. Lord, I pray your presence and blessing on every person that listens. And I pray that uh, we would all hear from each other and we would learn together, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyway, welcome again. Uh, just feel free anytime during this discussion. Just uh, put your uh, put your comments down, and uh, love to share some of those and, and let other people. You know, when other people watch this video, they'll read your comments and they'll read the thing, your thoughts and ideas, and that you might help somebody. So anyway, let's get going. First John, written by the Apostle John. There's uh, there are those who would say it was an elder, but there's actually, as far as I can tell, there is no reason to believe that John the Apostle did not write this. I mean, you just have to want him not to have written it uh, because everything in it is just like his other writings. His language is the same. Um, the date, there's no reason to believe that it didn't wasn't written in the same time uh, as his life. Um, so anyway, and all the words he uses, he uses in his gospel, he uses in his other letters. I believe that John the Apostle wrote this. It was the Apostle of Jesus of James and John, the sons of thunder. He's writing this, and uh, he begins almost exactly the way he begins the Gospel of John. Um, in 1 John chapter 1, it starts off, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. You know, John starts off by... Uh, beginning you know John if you read any of John's writings you see that his big passion is to let people know that Jesus is more than a prophet a teacher he is the word of life he is the logos um, it's a very interesting thing that word word where it says word of life that logos means the written word but it also means the uh, definite and uh, absolute word of God, you know, God created the world by the spoken word. It says in the in John one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Later in John, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so John starts off letting us know that Jesus is the word. You know that word logos? Can I just give you a little bit of little bit of fancy stuff? The the word logos uh, actually mean can be translated the reason. Uh, in Greek philosophy, there was this quest for the Logos, the reason of life. In fact, uh, Tim Keller said that by the time John wrote his gospel, 
Um, a lot of philosophers had given up their search for the logos. They didn't believe there was a meaning of life. They didn't, they just kind of, well, you know, it's either pleasure or discipline or something, but there's no real reason for life. And at that stage, so it's interesting that John would come along writing right in the middle of that void, that philosophical void where people were saying, you know, there's really no reason. You just got to live and survive. A lot of people are like that today. And John's saying, oh, no, the, the reason was with God, and the reason was God, and the reason dwelt among us, put on flesh, and dwelt among us. Isn't that cool? And so John is saying, oh, there's a reason for life, and his name is Jesus. Now, in 1 John, he says, look, I'm not writing this second hand. We heard him, we the apostles, and the people who lived with Jesus. The thousands of people who were touched by his ministry, John says, we've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, and we even touched with our hands concerning the word of life. You know, at the end of Luke, Jesus tells his disciples, here, touch my hands and see. As you can tell, flesh, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Touch me. You know, they, they, they made contact. You know, the, uh, what, what we really need is what John is proclaiming here. These first four verses, John is is giving a, like a, a celebration. He's saying, look, the word has come. The reason has come. And we saw him. We heard him. We talked to him. We spent time with him. You know, God's calling us to a personal experience with him. God wants you not to just know about him secondhand. God wants you to experience him in a first way, in a personal way. Now, one day we will touch him. One day... When you get to heaven, you'll see him face to face. But you know what the Bible tells us? In 1 John chapter 3, we're going to read later on, it says that one day we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. We don't get the privilege yet of seeing him face to face yet, but we do hear him. He'll speak to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit. He speaks to us through anointed teachers and preachers. He speaks to us through nature. He's, he's present in all, thing, in all these things. And the living word, the word that became flesh. And so John goes on in verse 2 to tell more about this. He says, and the life was made manifest. Now he uses that word twice in this verse. The word manifest. And we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now that word manifest is a really important word. It means made obvious, made clear. You know, uh, there was nothing vague or, 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 or mysterious about Jesus showing up. He came walking along the shore of Galilee and saying, Repent, the King of Heaven is at hand. Believe the good news. Listen, he came in a clear way. He was manifested before his disciples and before thousands of people. Thousands of people saw him and heard him and experienced him. So when John writes these letters, you know, a lot of people try to say that the scriptures aren't reliable because they were written years after the apostles. Well, that's just not true. There are literally thousands of manuscripts written within that century of, of the Gospels and, and even within the second century. That are, that are very easily traced to the apostles and very easily give evidence that they were written by the apostles. Uh, you have to try not to believe that uh, in order to, to evade this because th these weren't fantasies written 70 years later. These were written during the lives of the eyewitnesses themselves. And here's the interesting thing, is that this, gospel, this letter was written by an eyewitness and it was written during the time of other eyewitnesses. You see, there's there's the kicker. Because if he had written it just as an eyewitness and said, Yeah, I saw it and, and I'm writing about it to a bunch of people who hadn't even who weren't alive at the time, th th then it would be kind of scandalous, kind of sketchy, right? But the fact is that when he wrote that letter, the the people that had been there were living. And so he could have been easily refuted if he was lying. If he had been saying something and all those people still alive, they'd go, oh, Jesus didn't do that. I didn't see that. What are you talking about? It's kind of like in Paul in, in, uh, in his letter in 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about how Jesus appeared to more than 500 uh, brothers and sisters at once after his resurrection. And it says some of those, or many of those are still alive. 
Now, when he wrote that letter to Corinth in the first century, he said a lot of these people that saw him, they're still living. Now, Paul would, would have been taking a terrible risk if that weren't true because anybody <clears throat> wanting to disprove the resurrection, and believe me, there were plenty, would have gone to him and said, uh, I can't find any of those people you're talking about. But they were there were hundreds. Over 500 at one time saw Jesus risen from the dead. His apostles gave their lives testifying to his resurrection. And they, they suffered brutal torture rather than recant. Uh, they could have easily, John was the oldest of all the apostles. He outlived all of them. And he could have easily, as an old man, said, you know, we were just full of ourselves. We were full of steam. We were delusional. and You know, but he didn't. He never recanted. He died his last breath, was proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. This man uh, knew, knew what he was talking about. And so he's writing it as an eyewitness during the time of eyewitnesses, of other eyewitnesses, to verify there's no way to get out of this, that he was writing within the context of the history he was proclaiming. Now, if he had written it 20 years later, uh, after everything was over, 50 years later, 100 years later, you know, then we could say, well, it creates a legend. He just made up a legend. But the apostles started proclaiming the resurrection right after it happened immediately on pain of death they were threatened if you keep talking about this we're going to kill you and uh, and so John John just refused his brother James was murdered by Herod for his proclamation of the truth at that point why wouldn't his brother John say okay okay uh, we were lying we were wrong I got my brother killed over a lie no he kept on he kept on and he's saying here look we're proclaiming to you what we experienced, what we saw, we heard, right? And so this is, this is a, a powerful, powerful truth. Now look at verse 3. Um, in verse 3 it says, That which we've seen and heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> What's he saying here? He's saying, look, what we've experienced, we don't want to keep to ourselves. Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. And John, John wrote that in his gospel. John heard that. He took that to heart. He said, what we've heard and seen for ourselves, we want to give it to you so you can have fellowship with us. You know, if they had had a religious spirit, they would have said, well, we know the secret. We're going to keep it to ourselves and uh, we're not going to share it with anybody unless we think they're worthy, unless we, we're going to let them in the club because we don't, you know, religion wants to see how many people it can keep out. But saving faith says, let's bring them in. Let's bring everybody in. I, I worry about people who are so religious that they want to see how many people they can keep out of heaven. Oh, you know, you can't believe. No, you can't believe. No, you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. John's saying, come, come. Listen, whoever's thirsty, let him come. Come. Uh, we want you to have fellowship with us. And I love that word fellowship. That word, I preached on this yesterday, that word fellowship means community. And, they, you know, I think one of the greatest needs in our society today is community. I've heard more and more talk about how lonely our society is. Uh, our whole society is lonely. We've got 300 million lonely people in the United States of America. We're a lonely country. We're a lonely people. We have allowed, and I'm going to tell you what's happened over the last three years especially, we have allowed political correctness and suspicion to drive us all apart so that everybody is just kind of afraid of each other, suspicious of each other. It's safer to stare into our phones than it is to look somebody in the eye and talk to them because we don't want to be labeled as a racist or a sexist or a, or this or that or whatever. And we don't want to be called a liberal or a conservative. We don't want to be left or right. We don't want anybody to tell, say bad things about us. And so we're all afraid of each other. Even in church, we're afraid of each other. You know, the Bible describes the church as a fellowship, a community of people who lay down their lives for each other, pray for each other, confess their faults to one another, spend time, feed into each other, invest in each other. 
But many churches today were these isolated little people coming in and parking in ourselves in our isolated pews, trying to make sure that we don't get too close to anybody while we listen to the sermon and criticize the preacher so we can go home and feel like we went to church. But but there's this empty void created by that. That's religion. The, the real faith is as when a person is willing to lay down their life for each other and feed into each other. And John is saying, look, we're telling you this so we can have fellowship with you and you can have fellowship with us because our fellowship really is with the Father. And John's not afraid to say, we know the Father. We're related to him and we want you to be connected to him. You know, friend, let me tell you something. This is a great opportunity for the church to, to, to re-educate the world on what it means to have community. And this is one of the greatest opportunities, if we'll take hold of it, to bring people together. Now, not in some worldly kind of, you know, love is love, you know, nonsense. But I'm talking about genuine love based on faith in Jesus Christ, drawing people together, loving the sinner, loving our enemy, being honest with people about what we believe and who we are and, and inviting people to sit down and talk with us, not not beating them up and running them off if they disagree, but being willing to have a real connection with people. Church ought to connect people. You know, it ought to connect people in Him. In Him. And it, there is that exclusive exclusivity that is important, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the risen one. He is the way to heaven. And we have to be that, we have to say that because that's true. But at the same time, we can be loving people, reaching out to people, uh, calling people to join us at the table, you know, seeing who we can bring in rather than who we can keep out. And I, I really believe that we need to work on being community. What can your church do? What can your church do to break down the walls in your community? What can your church do? To bring people together instead of being suspicious over race and gender, instead of being suspicious over your political ideas and that, why don't we just say, you know, we may disagree, we may be different, let's celebrate our differences, but let's come together around the table of Jesus, around the bread and the wine, and let's worship together and love him together, and let's be brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus said in John's Gospel, by the way, all of this, I'm, I'm quoting the John's Gospel to show you how clearly parallel it is to his first John. Let me tell you, um, people, Jesus said, look, they'll know you're my disciples if you love each other. When the world looks at the church and they see us loving each other, that's a great testimony. I've enjoyed on my Facebook, I've been doing these, uh, you know, shout outs to different pastors during Pastor Appreciation Month. It's been a real joy, but what the real joy has been is to hear other people chime in and comment and say, you know, my pastor is so great. I love my pastor. Or I love this pastor and their family. And, and you just to hearing people say great things about one another. None of us are perfect. I know we all got flaws. But what if we really continue to do that? Continue to honor one another, celebrate each other, pray for each other, love each other, uh, share. Even if we have to conflict each other, even if we have to disagree, we can do it in love. So anyway, John is saying, look, we're saying this stuff to you because we've got fellowship with the Father. And fellowship with the Father naturally leads me to want to have fellowship with other people. You know, if your, your religion is driving you away from everybody so that you don't care about anybody, then you've got a big dose of religion. But Jesus wants you to have his spirit that says, go out and love people, care for people, reach out to people. You know, speak the truth in love. Stand up for the gospel, but do it in a way that Jesus would do it. Let Jesus come through and love people through you. Um, even in those moments when you've got to stand up and speak the truth and it's unpopular, you can do that in a spirit of love and conviction and stand true to it and still be have an open door to people who want to come talk. And so let's love each other. Uh, start with the people in your own church, in your own home and your church start with them start just looking around who who you know let me let me look at it this way some people when they go into church here's what they do they go in they sit down they turn their radar on and they look around to see who's going to be nice to me who's going to love me and i and i that's a valid question i, I we all want to be loved and i don't i don't criticize that at all but i think you'll you'll have a different way of thinking if you'll go into church next time and say who needs love for me who can I pray for? 
Not who's going to pray for me. Who can I pray for? Even if you're in need and hurting, that's, you know, one of the most healing things you can do is heal somebody else. That's true. That's true. And so, John, this is what fellowship, that word koinonia, that fellowship word means in verse 3. He's saying we want fellowship. Fellowship is more than being stuck in a building together. Um, it, it, it's coming together in relationship, in accountability, in encouragement, and in, in strength and care and compassion for each other. And I, I, I believe that we have a great opportunity because we're in a lonely, lonely culture. A lonely culture. And we don't have to all agree on everything. Um, but let's come together in love and just love one another as Jesus did. And, uh, and build relationships with people. Put your phone down. I know I'm, I'm speaking into a phone right now. <laughs> and I know you might be watching this on your phone. You know, and, and I'm not saying never use it. But what I'm saying is sometimes we need to put that thing down and love people. And you know what? Don't even take it to church. I know you got your Bible app on there. Bring you a, bring you a Bible that's a hardbound Bible. Leave your phone in your purse or your pocket or somewhere like that. And just turn it off when you go into church. Because it's so tempting isn't it, to get off on that thing. Um, and don't worry about tweeting the preacher's sermon or anything like that. You can do that later. Just get in there. Turn that. Unplug. Get in there and love somebody. Just get in there and love somebody. You know, that's something God wants us to do. And I, and I believe he can do so, so many great things. Verse 4. I really love verse 4. It's such a short statement. John writes, And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I preached on this yesterday. I, I, uh, um, I won't always be echoing my sermons, but yesterday, you know, it really spoke to me. That verse spoke to me more than any of the other verses. Is that He said, look, we're writing this stuff so our joy can be complete. Now, the, the Greek manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts, actually some of them have that our joy may be complete and some of them have that your joy may be complete. And it really doesn't matter the difference because they're both true. Um, Jesus said, "If you, I say these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. The fullness of joy comes when I share my faith with other people. Do you know that? That the more I share him, the more full my joy becomes. But not only that, it's also true that when I share him, I'm giving joy to other people. The people rejoice over good news. Here's the thing. Jesus, one of my favorite things, in John chapter 4, John writes about Jesus meeting a woman at a well and transformed her life in one afternoon. One conversation, one moment of fellowship changes this woman's life forever. And she goes into town and she shares her testimony. Her joy is complete because she says many came to believe because of her testimony. And then, but Jesus said something to his disciples right after that. They came to him and said, Jesus, you need something to eat. And he said, I've got food you don't know about. They didn't understand. They thought somebody else had brought him lunch. He said, no, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You know, what he's saying is, you know what feeds my soul? Being in partnership with my dad. You know, that's awesome. Jesus is saying, there is nothing that feeds my soul more than doing what my dad taught me to do, gave me to do. Loving him being in partnership with him, working with him. Friend, your Christian service ought not be a drudgery. It ought not be, oh, I've got to serve God. Oh, I better do some good things. No. Listen, you are being invited into this joyous relationship with your Heavenly Father. He wants to work with you. you no, know, he could do all this himself. He really could. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He could preach the gospel with a teaspoon. I mean, he could get this stuff done a lot better than I'm doing it. Here's the thing. But he loves me. And he wants to work with me. He wants to work through me. And, and that's how he does. He does that with Jesus. And, and, you know, it's his apostles. Jesus didn't need them apostles. He sent them out. He said, look, I, I just I want to work with you. I want you to be with me. And I, I want to work through you. That's why, that's why he said in John 15, he said, you know, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Prove yourselves to be my disciples. And then he said, these things I write to you, that my joy might be in you, and that your joy might be complete. You see, it's the, it is the, I'll tell you this, the more that you are involved 
in the work of the gospel, whatever way God leads you to do it, the more joy you're going to have. I get more joy. I just get joy preaching. I mean, I, I just, it lights my fire. It floats my boat, bakes my bread. You know, it just, I get the joy out of it. I'm just doing it. I mean, even if people don't listen, I just love to talk about what he did. I love to talk about the scripture. I love to unpack the word. Now, not everybody likes to preach. Not everybody, that's not where you get your joy from. Some people like to sing. Um, you know, some people like to, to work with kids. Some people like to just hand out food to the hungry. Some people like to, you know, uh, go down to the courthouse and advocate for some kid who just needs somebody to stand with them. You know, some people just love to be a listening ear. That, that's what they do for the Lord, for the kingdom. And it just gives them joy, you know. I, I'll bet that God has given you some things that give you a lot of joy to do for his kingdom. Somehow, God wants to use your gifts to bring joy not only to you, but to others and to God. God's heart rejoices. Over, the Bible says he rejoices over his anointed. You know, he sings for joy over his children. You know, and uh, I, I, I love that about God, that he gets such joy out of just watching you do what you do. And uh, I mean, what, what parent doesn't love watching their kids grow and do great things? And then, then you get joy out of doing the work, and people that you minister to get joy because you brought something good into their life. You know, we, as God's people, we have you know, a true Christian has experienced Jesus in a personal way, just like John said. We've seen, we've heard, we've seen with our eyes. We've touched him. Now, you may not have touched him physically, but if you're a true believer, you've come in contact with him in a life-changing way. And, and, and when you do, the natural flow of that, according to this passage, is, is that you want to tell about it. You want to proclaim it. You know, I, I want to proclaim what he's done. Um, and so if, if, if you have a desire to glorify him, that's evidence of his presence in your life because you wouldn't have that desire except by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit living in you. And John says, that which we've experienced, we want to share with you. You know, so I want to ask you this question. Do you, do you have that? Have you ever experienced the Lord Jesus? You might say, well, I prayed a prayer one time. I, Good, I'm glad you prayed prayer. But have you experienced him? Experiencing him is far more than saying a religious prayer at, a, at an altar. Experiencing him might in, will involve a prayer. It will involve quite a bit of prayer. Experiencing him comes when you realize your need for Jesus Christ in your life. You realize that there's an emptiness, there's a lostness about you. You realize that you can't earn God's love in your life and you need it and you know you need God and there's something between you and God that needs to change. You realize that Christ is the Son of God and he died for you and rose again and, and you've asked him to forgive you of your sins. You've repented of your sin. Now some people ask for forgiveness but they don't repent. And I have to tell you that, that asking forgiveness without repentance is kind of religious. Um, and it's not really helpful. True conversion happens when I repent of my sin. When I say, Lord, I don't want you just to forgive me. I want you to change me. You know what I'm saying? That's repentance. It's, it's, I realize that, that this life that I'm living is out of the, the step with God. It's not in alignment with Him. And, and I, and I, I want to live and, and walk with Him. And so I, I, I surrender my will to Him. You see, a lot of people say, well, I prayed that prayer and nothing changed. Well, that's because you, you were playing magic. You, you thought you, you say the superstitious prayer and it would just suddenly fix everything. The prayer is an expression of happen, what's happening in your heart. And if not, something's not happening in your heart, it don't matter how many times you pray that prayer. You can pray it 50 times. Get honest with God about your sins and turn from them. That, that's where you start off. Say, God, help me. Convict me. Show me where I need to turn to you. And then you make those steps and say, God, I'm turning from this. If it's gossip, turn from it. If it's sexual immorality, perversion, turn from it. If it's violence, if it's greed, if it's the worship of things, turn from it. If it's simple unbelief, I mean, sometimes people are well behaved, they just don't believe. Maybe you just need to make a decision, you're going to start believing God today. You know, you've been a pretty decent person, you hadn't done a whole lot of things, but you know what? It's sin to disbelieve 
uh, unbelief is sin. All unbelief is sin, the Bible says. And so uh, all disobedience is sin. Everything that, And so I turn from that lifestyle. I turn from that lifestyle. I don't just cherry pick certain sins and confess them. I turn from a self-centered way. And I say, Lord, I'm tired of living my way. I want to live your way. You know what? When that happens, when you surrender to him, he takes those sins. He forgives you completely. And then he, he cleanses your heart and your conscience and your mind, your spirit. He frees you from, from uh, everything demonic and evil and dark. And he gives you a brand new life. He makes you a new person. And you're going to want to tell somebody. I can just tell you. I don't, you don't, Spurgeon says you don't have to tell somebody who's a real Christian that they ought to be telling people. Because they, the Spirit will tell them himself. Listen, uh, God, God wants to do something in your life that will change you. He wants you to, to be able to say what John said. That which we've seen and heard and we've handled, we've touched, we've encountered ourselves. And now we're proclaiming it to you because that's where we get our joy from. My joy comes from him my joy doesn't come from my circumstances it comes from it doesn't come from my bank account it doesn't come from my love life it comes from him it comes from knowing him and making him known friend if you'll get on board with jesus get on board with him he'll transform your life he'll change it this is what john's inviting us to now as we wrap up i'm going to pray in just a minute I want to invite you, if you've been listening, if you have thoughts about this passage, and we're going to start doing this every day, um, as you have your Bible out and you're reading John 1, 1 through 4, 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and you have your own insights, I wish you'd type those in to the comments, and we'll just have a conversation. Um, I'm not interested in fighting over religion. Uh, save that for somebody else. But I do want to hear your thoughts about the Scripture. What's he saying? And what have you read in 1 John 1, 1 through 4? that has blessed your heart and or has challenged you or maybe given you a question. Um, and so whether you're reading it, watching this on Facebook or on my YouTube channel, uh, give some comments and let's talk about the word together and let's grow together. Listen, let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, it's been a joy uh, to just go through these four verses. There's so much uh, in your word and so much in these, these simple four verses. Lord, you are our joy. Uh, the fullness of joy comes from you. Uh, you came that we might have life and have it to the full, and it comes from walking with you daily. It comes from knowing you and being in relationship with you. And uh, Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, that I sought the Lord and he heard my cry and delivered me from all my fears. Lord, that's, that's our testimony today. Now, now, Lord, lead us to be joyful proclaimers of the word of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening in. Be sure and leave some comments. God bless you. Go in peace.